Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the Black Eagles part one presentation. Before we get started, I would like to ask everyone to please switch off their videos. Um, as you can see the button on the screen in the toolbar. Please just get that done so that it's not distracting to everyone else during this presentation. So your presenters this evening will be myself and Ernest Porter. Now Ernest is extremely passionate about nature and photography, and he has been a wildlife photographer since 2011. He is also a committee member for two non-profit organizations, namely the Botanical Society of South Africa, as well as the Black Eagle Project of Rodecrans. He is a qualified for Gaza guide currently working for a photo safari company called Eagle Eye Safaris. And as you can see, they are the proud sponsor of this webinar this evening. And this company he started with a friend in 2016. So myself, Candace Donovan, I have an honors degree in zoology and nature conservation, and I have been a passionate member of the Black Eagle Project since 2004. I absolutely love enthusing people to appreciate nature and all living beings around them and I find education to be such a vital tool in doing so. So what is the Black Eagle Project? Who are we? Well, in essence, we are this orange group of people right here at the top, <laughs> but really we are a group of volunteers that are mainly there to monitor the Black Eagles at the Walter Sisulu National Botanical Gardens on weekends and on public holidays. And also very importantly, what we do is we educate the public and we inform them about these incredible birds and raptors in general. So what we'll do in order to do this is take a telescope and we'll set it up at the Walter Sisulu National Botanical Gardens by the waterfall in the bowl at the bottom. So here we can see this roof right here at the bottom. That is where we'll set up the telescope because the eagles common perches as well as the nests are visible from this point. Any interest that passes by can then view the eagles or the nest or anything that there is to be seen through the telescope set up by the monitor and then they can engage in a nice little informative chat. So in doing so, we aim to conserve and protect the black eagles in the Walter Sisulu National Botanical Gardens for future generations to enjoy. Now let's take a closer look at the heart of our project, the black over rose eagle. Majestic, powerful, and absolutely striking. I'm sure anyone would agree that this is one awe-inspiring bird. Black eagles are apex predators in the ecosystems that they occur in, and they play a very important role in maintaining the health of these ecosystems, which is very good news as they are locally a fairly common resident with very stable populations in South Africa, as well as a very large distribution range. So they are le listed as least concern on the IUCN red list. Black eagles are usually seen in pairs because they mate for life and these partners will only be replaced in the event of death. They spend between 75 and 95 percent of the day close together bonding, so they can often be seen preening, perching and even flying together in perfect unison. This is, however, only when they are not breeding, as when they are breeding, the female will usually be on the nest, guarding the, the egg or the chicks and the male will be off hunting. So in this photo, we see a breeding pair. And it is pretty obvious that the male and female look very alike in their plumage coloration. Mm -hmm. So sometimes this does present quite a bit of a problem for monitors, as we do sometimes actually struggle to tell them apart. So one way that we can use to, to do this is to compare their sizes, because the females are usually a little bit larger than the males. But once again, this is also easier said than done, because it's not often that they sit perfectly still side by side for us to do a size comparison. These pairs are resident, which means they live there year round and they are territorial all the time as well. Now, black eagles, like many other raptors, have incredible eyesight and to maintain the sharpness of their vision, they have what is known as a nictitating membrane, which is this membrane you see on this picture here. And what this nictitating membrane is, is a transparent or inner eyelid that helps to clean their eyes of any dust or dirt. It helps to protect their eyes and it also helps to keep them moist. Now this membrane slides, ho slides horizontally across the eye every three to four seconds. As seen in this photo, it slides from the inside of the eye across and back again every three to four seconds. As I mentioned earlier, it is very difficult to tell the sexes apart, but another tool that we have made use of in the past is looking at the differences in the eye ring as well as in this ridge 
above the eye because sometimes that actually varies between individuals. So it's just it's another something that we can look at to tell the individuals apart. And while we're on this slide, I'd just like to point out that beautiful, strong, big beak that they have. I will be mentioning that a little bit later. Now, this is a very distinguishing feature on the black eagles, the Y shape on the back, as well as the white rump. And as you can see all together, this actually makes the shape of an angel, which is quite beautiful. Now, females in general have more white in these patterns than the males do. And in order to keep these and all their other feathers in good condition, to keep them waterproof as well as supple, these birds will preen daily. The preen gland is at the base of the tail, and what that does is releases an oil that they spread over their feathers with their beaks, and they will do this from the base of the feathers all the way through to the tips. Now for the business end of these hunters, the talons. Essentially, these are what makes the bird raptors, having strong grasping feet that are used in conjunction with the talons to seize their prey. That is what a raptor is. The only other thing that makes them a raptor is the fact that they eat only meat and of course that they have that sharp hooked beak I showed you earlier for ripping that meat apart. These talons are so crucial to their survival. From the day that they hatch, their life is pretty much a battlefield. I mean, on the nest, chicks will kill each other and during the Cain and Abel struggle, adults are aggressive towards the juveniles to force them to leave the area. Territories need to be defended, prey needs to be killed. I mean, it's a pretty violent life and without these weapons, the eagles would simply not be able to eagle. With an average wingspan of about two meters, which makes up to 6.5 feet, a bill to tip length of up to one meter or three feet, and a weight of up to four and a half kilograms, which is up to 10 pounds, black eagles are in the top three biggest eagles in Southern Africa. Their wings also have quite a distinctive shape in flight. They're quite narrow at the base of the wing, and then they become broadest here towards the outer, outer secondaries in the middle of the wing, and then they taper again towards the tips. Now, these birds are perfectly capable of putting these wings to good use because the shape facilitates gliding up drafts created when wind strikes the mountain cliffs where they, where they occur. So that allows them to stay airborne for long periods of time, or it also allows them to travel great distances. They are also able to fly into strong winds and maintain control unlike other birds. So they are incredibly strong flyers, which also means that their aerial displays are really quite a sight to behold. So they have displays that they will show throughout the year, and they can be for one of two reasons, either for courtship or territorial displays. Now, the territorial flights occur at the boundary of a home range, but sometimes these territorial displays can also happen near the nest. And these kind of displays include talent gripping and also tumbling. And these are a fight between birds. So this will be a parent and a juvenile. They'll be fighting like this or rival territory holders. The courtship displays start with mutual soaring, however, where the male will follow the female. And then they'll start to make spectacular undulating flights, falling and climbing hundreds of meters. And their bodies are perfectly designed to perform these aerobatics. So here we can see one such display where the eagle's flying down, falling, and then lifts up right at the end again. This photo highlights two of the main icons at the Walter Sisulu National Botanical Gardens, the waterfall and the eagles. So this truly is a little gem hidden in the city of Johannesburg, and it truly is an incredible sight and something I think that everyone should experience at least once in their life. And this photo really captures the essence of this specific pair in that they are an urban based pair. This comes with both advantages and disadvantages, but what we do know is that it is pretty special and also very convenient because they are right on our doorstep. Hunting is also something they've needed to adapt being in an urban area. So there was a very extensive study done many years ago by Valerie Gargett, and it's called the Black Eagle where it was found that in the wild in Matopo Hills in Zimbabwe, away from humans and any sort of urbanization, that up to 90% of the black eagle diet consists of dussies. But the Walter Susulu National Botanical Garden pair 
that need to deal with developments that reduce their hunting grounds and thus needing to fly, potentially fly further to find food have di um, slightly different stats from that. So from prey records in 2014 and 2015 from the live cam, as you can see down here, the guinea fowl make up 57% of their diet, so that is the majority. Rock hyraxes or dusty only make up 25%, with the scrub hair at the bottom with only 18%. So in this photo, we see an eagle with the most common prey type, the guinea fowl, or as they're sometimes more often referred to, the disco chicken. And here we have the eagle carrying the dusty, which is the second most common type of prey. So it's quite funny because when this photo was first taken and published, people thought that this was a small pig. So clearly Dussies aren't as well known as they could be. So just to give you a little bit of information, they are small, sociable, rock-dwelling mammals, and they have short legs and padded feet that are always moist due to specialized glands. So the moisture on their feet helps them to climb quickly up very steep um, rocks and tree, trunk, trunk, tree trunks and branches, and this is to duck and dive from predator attacks. They also have a very robust body and no tail, as you can see in this photo. And they have quite a wide distribution in Africa, but only occur on rocky outcrops, cliffs, or piles of large rocks and boulders where suitable vegetation for their diet is found. So here in this photo, you can see just how stocky their bodies really are. And they can actually weigh up to just as much as the eagles weigh, so four and a half kilograms. So if a dusty is too heavy, what an eagle will do to be able to transport it is to decapitate the dusty and maybe they'll take out some of the intestines as well and that will lighten the load so that they will be able to carry the dusty away. One more interesting fact about the dusties is that they're actually considered to be the closest living relative of elephants as well as dugongs and manatees. Now there are many similarities between dusties and elephants. Um, None of them are quite obvious if you have a look at the size, but the, one of the main similarities is that their tusks develop from the incisors as opposed to from their canine teeth in other animals. So that is one reason why they're closely related. And also the fact that they only have two mammary glands, which is also spe specific to the elephants. Scrub hairs present the exact same issue of weight to the eagles because they too can weigh up to four and a half kilograms. So the eagles solve this problem in exactly the same way. Just another interesting point to note is that the Valerie Gogget study I mentioned earlier did not mention anything about the eagles having feeding spots. So a feeding spot is like a grass patch or a ledge or a rock, somewhere where they tend to take food often to feed there. But at the botanical gardens, we have clearly seen certain feeding spots that they frequent. And it could be due to the fact that they are an urban based pair, so they know that those feeding spots are safer than eating where they caught their prey. Perhaps there's a lot of people where they caught their prey. Maybe it's near a road, so it's stressful, it's busy. Maybe they hunt in a, a nature reserve and there's, there's, they'll be exposed to predators there. So that may just be one of the reasons why they like to have the feeding spots in the gardens. Also, as I mentioned earlier, they are often found in pairs. So most likely when they hunt, they'll use this to their, to their advantage by having one eagle distract or flush the prey and the other one can then attack. They also like to hunt airily or they can hunt from their poachers as well, but occasionally they also scavenge, but this has been found to be mostly the juvenile eagles that, that eat anything that they find before they learn to hunt proficiently. Mating is done year round and it is a form of bond strengthening and then it's also used for fertilization for egg laying when the breeding season is imminent. So mating will occur more frequently from around February as egg laying is usually around April time. They'll mate near the nest site and it is quite a quick process, only five to 10 seconds. And it actually looks like quite a dangerous process too, because if you have a look here, look where that male's talons are during copulation but very luckily we haven't had any such injuries reported as of yet. I will now be handing you over to Ernest and he'll be talking to you more about the nest building process. Thank you so much Candice. So I will just be sharing my screen quickly, just give me a few seconds to just get that on. Okay, perfect. 
So as Kanda said, I will be continuing from the nest building stage. So these eagles basically start nest building around March, early March, maybe end of Feb, and they start off with bringing branches or sticks to the nest, the current nest that they already have. And as you can see in this photo, they sometimes bring in what could almost be classified as a tree, if you look at this size. So the eagle's wingspan, as Candace mentioned, is about two meters in average from the tip, one tip to the other tip. Now, this wings are, these wings are a little bit bent, so I would say that this branch from there to there is probably at least two and a half meters. Quite impressive for an eagle to fly around with a branch that size. So this photo just really illustrates the power of a black eagle for me. So this was the female and she was collecting another stick for the nest. But you know how big these eagles are by now. You have at least got an idea. And you can see that she's actually breaking off a branch from, an, from this or the stick from this branch. And it's quite a thick stick. You know, I would probably even struggle just to break it off there and they just clamp on and use their powerful balls to snap it off. It's quite amazing. So it's interesting to know that black eagles might have more than one nest in an area. So at Walter Sisulu Botanical Garden, we actually had three nests at one time, where uh, it happened basically in 2016 when we had a new female and she built a third nest. So in the past, Emoyeni preferred to use only two nests or she had to nest and only prefer to breed on one actually. So that's just an interesting fact. And they can also alternate um, to different nests each year. So the theories why they do this could be because the nest might become a little bit um, dirty with all the rotting meat, etc. So it, it might lead into less pests if you alternate between nests every year. Etc. So that is just one interesting theory as to why they might alternate in their territory to a different nest. So next up, we've got the same bird, Emoyeni, and in this photo, you can just see how those talons just pop out, how powerful and dangerous and amazing those talons are. So it's also an, another interesting fact about these black eagles are that they do not build, rebuild a new nest every season. They basically just build on top of a current nest. So every year it basically gets refurbished and then they reuse that same nest after they've added the new sticks on top. And that also means that the nest will always continue to grow from year to year. Okay, so this nest is the one that Emoyeni actually did not use, but it was available in her um, territory. The one year with 2013 with Nessie, um, they had a clutch failure on the, the uh, preferred nest, and they were actually building for about two weeks on the top nest, but they did not commit to build or to breed on this nest. And my feeling is that there's just not enough space for them on this nest. As you can see, there's this overhanging cliff that's basically a roof. And every time they build on the nest and it becomes bigger and bigger, they get closer to this roof. And it's just, it's at a point where it's not big enough for two black eagles, plus a juvenile on the nest. So Emoyeni never used this nest since I started the pro joined the project since 2013. So next up, um, this is one of my favorite photos of Emoyeni, and I always refer to this as the Quidditch player in Harry Potter. It looks like a witch on a broomstick. I was just very lucky that day to get such an iconic photo of how she carried the stick. Very cute. Okay, and then like you saw with the first photo, they sometimes bring in massive sticks to the nest. So. This is yet another massive branch being brought. It literally looks like a portable home, like she's just moving her nest to a new site. It's almost that big. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But yeah, no, they, they obviously do this. And an interesting fact about this is that I've actually never seen them commit and take a stick like this to the nest. It seems to be more of a playful thing where they just collect a massive branch, take take the challenge of carrying this big branch and then they drop this branch somewhere. They don't go land on the nest. And you can kind of imagine why, 
because it, just think if this eagle had to land with this massive branch, she'll probably impale herself with one of these branches. It will be so difficult to land on top of this branch on top of the nest. So it's just quite interesting that it's a little bit of a playful thing for them. I just really hope she's not going to drop this branch on somebody's head in the botanical garden one day. And then next up the opposite, an eagle bringing in a tiny branch. So I just thought I had to share this with you guys. It's it's just so cute. They sometimes do things that I can't explain. You know, what's this little stick really going to help with nest building? But they do it. I've got multiple photos of them just bringing in the tiniest little stick to the nest. Maybe this is the last stick for the day and the energy just ran low. So the, in this um, March, basically, you'll see mostly sticks being brought into the nest. And then later on, when it's getting closer to egg laying time, they will start switching over to green sprays. And this would be usually end of March to mid April, just before the eggs are laid. And even after the eggs are laid, they'll still bring in fresh new green sprays to the nest. Now, I just also had to include this photo in the slideshow because it's just such a funny photo. It looks like the eagle is actually flying with a satchel. And then there are basically two purposes that these green sprays can have on the nest, depending on what specific uh, leaves or tweaks they pick from what a specific plant. So the first um, purpose is quite straightforward, and that is just to create a soft cup for the eggs. Because you can imagine you can't just go lay the eggs on all those sticks. There needs to be a soft cup. And then some plants they target for certain properties like keeping away pests like flies from the nest. So obviously bringing their prey to the nest and having rotting meat, etc. attracts pests and then specific trees and specific leaves might have properties that keep away these pests. So it just shows the intelligence of these birds and the million of years of evolution. Now, I just have to give you a little bit of background on this photo and how much effort I had to go through to get this photo. So I usually go and photograph the black eagles in the mornings, but I had to go in the evening or afternoon, I mean, to get this photo. It was around two to four o'clock, if I remember correctly. Now, there, I, I noticed that there was a certain time when if the eagle brings a stick or a leave onto the nest that the eagle will be in the full sunlight and then be in full sunlight and then there will be shadows in the background. So this basically was a 30 minute window that I had. Then the sun become too low and the bird was also in the shade. So I was just sitting there for 30 minutes hoping that this eagle is going to come to the nest now to drop this leaf or branch in this 30 minutes I've got so that I can try and get the photo. So, and I think I basically spent two weeks trying this and I ended up with two opportunities. So the next photo is just another great illustration to show you that these eagles are in an urban area, building nest, their nest in an urban area, as you can see someone's um, house in the background. Okay, so let's talk about the nest a little bit. So I mentioned before that they basically build with sticks and then every year they continue building and building. So I've got this photo that gives you kind of an idea of the biggest nest we've had in Walter Sisulu. So this was back when Emoyeni was still breeding there. So Candace said that the tip of the bull to the tip of the tail of an, a full adult eagle is about three feet or by almost one centimeter. So I just measured this and made it three feet and 91.5 centimeters. And then I stacked one, two, three, four, and a part of one to get the length of the nest. So it is four times three feet plus 2.4 feet. So the, this, the length of the nest from the top to the bottom in this photo is about 4.39 meters and 14.4 feet. That just shows you what an amazing massive nest these guys are capable of building. It's really quite amazing. 
And then this is also just to illustrate you how quickly eagles can build nests. So this was a new nest that was built in on 7 January 2017. And then I will just switch to the next photo and you will. Oh, no, sorry, I'm on the wrong uh, slide. OK, so in this photo, we actually see that same nest uh, before and an after a hailstorm. So because of that massive size of that nest, it became probably too heavy and more fragile for bad weather conditions. And on 9 January 2016, half of this nest basically washed away. And I also just want to mention, sorry, that this was Emoyeni's favorite nest. And in March 2018, the second half also washed away. So at the moment, this nest does not exist. There's no more um, sticks at all in this area where that nest was, which Emoyeni used. Okay, so next up is an illustration of how quickly eagles build their nest. So on 7 January 2017, they started basically building this new nest. It was obviously a few days before 7 January, because you can see there's already a few sticks there. But I'm just going to switch to the next photo and you'll see how quickly this nest um, grown from 7 January to 24 March. So you can see now it actually starts looking like a nest that eagles can use for breeding. So this is the current nest that is still used um, by Makatsa at the moment. And then, so eagles also have sometimes a little bit of competition and or maybe geese or falcons that are interested in their nests. So in all the years I've been in the project, I've not had many, um, I would say, interactions between the eagles and other birds competing for nesting, but I've had these two photos and there weren't really any conflict between the eagles and the specific species. I just managed to take a photo of a goose on the nest, which eventually left the nest by itself. And then the peregrine falcons also just went onto the nest and then did not commit to it and did not breed. So the eagles did not actually have to chase them away. It was not in a breeding cycle. It was out of the breeding cycle, but the birds basically just gave way without the eagles needing to chase them off. OK, so next up after they've built this nest, they're now ready to lay the eggs. So you can see in this photo, this is the cup that was being built for the eggs. So it's a great illustration of what I mentioned previously. So egg laying usually happens around end April, April to mid May. And the eagles would start off by laying one egg and then four days later, a second egg. Though obviously the hatching will follow in this pattern. The first egg will hatch and then the second egg will hatch four days later. And it's quite amazing to see how much of an advantage the first chicks got by hatching first and being fed for four days before the second one hatches. And this obviously gives the first hatched an advantage to overpower the smaller, younger sibling. And that is where the Cain and Abel struggle that is referred to comes in, where the one chick actually kills the other chick. But a lot of people would say, you know what, it is such a waste, a second egg and a second chick just being killed every time but there is actually a purpose for this and that is that the first egg doesn't always hatch it could be they could have gone something wrong so if this the first egg did not hatch and the second one hatched then that chick will basically be the one that will be raised so it's almost like an insurance policy for black eagles and this always makes it possible for them to raise at least one chick every year OK, so next up, I must just mention that the following photos um, on the nest were taken by Garf Heidenrich with a camera trap to not disturb them. So I've taken Ernest Porter has taken most of the photos except for all these photos on the nest. So we are looking at the chick of 2013 Nessie that's on the nest at eight days old. In these photos, we are going to illustrate you how quickly this little chick grows into an eaglet and then eventually into a juvenile eagle. So just keep an eye on the size of the chick and keep an eye on the amount of days old and you'll just see an amazing transformation. So from 8 to 18 days, it already looks like four times the size it was in the first photo. Quite amazing. 
and then on 32 days, we are now sitting with a full size chicken with eagle legs or eagle talons. And then just after that, now this young one is starting to eat. So in 57 days, it's almost as big as an adult. I'm not there yet, but getting there. And then an interesting thing that I would just like to um, talk to you guys about on this slide is that um, Candace mentioned the study in Motopo Hills where 90% of the prey brought in and killed was Kleptasi. But in Walter Sisulu, we have more diverse prey. Now, there's an interesting theory on this, and that is that these prey items, diverse dif different prey items in Walter Sisulu that's being brought into the nest for the youngster gets imprinted on the mind of the youngster. And when it basically leaves the area and needs to survive by itself, it's going to identify these different items that the adults brought in as prey. And that basically gives these guys a little bit of an edge to survive in difficult areas like urban areas where not enough clip dusties are around. So it's just an interesting theory to think about what we saw specifically at Walter Sisulu. So next up, we've got a 86 uh, days old juvenile. And at this stage, um, the youngsters would basically start doing some wing exercises, getting ready for that first flight. Now, it's interesting to note that the females are generally about 30% heavier than the males. And this would mean that they basically leave the nest a little bit later than the males do. So just as a general rule, we um, have the males leaving around 80 to 90 days and the females 90 to 100 days. But it is not foolproof, so we can't just, uh, if a, a bird flies on 92 days, we can't just assume that it's a female. It can just be a male fledging a little bit later. And then another interesting thing that the adults do to the youngsters at this stage is they stop bringing prey to the nest. Now, it's got two purposes. The first is the young one is basically starting to starve and he's getting lighter. He's not full or he's got no food in his crop or his uh, stomach. And basically, so that reduces weight. It's easier to take off. And it also, the adults would, for example, drop the prey inside of the young one in the young one's site, but on the mountain somewhere away from the nest. So this entices them to go for the prey because all they can think about is eating at this stage. They're very hungry, they are quite light, and now they just commit and they jump off and they can go for that prey. So we've actually seen the adults do this to youngsters to basically help them get off the nest. Now I must just mention one more interesting thing. I just did a little um, calculation. So if you think that a chick, when it hatches, it's probably got a wingspan of five centimeters, which would be two inches. And when it leaves the nest, it's got a wingspan of about two meters, which is um, six feet. Now, I calculated how much growth would there be on average every day. And the answer is basically two centimeters, which is just short of an inch. So. An average growth of two centimeters of in the wingspan from hatching to fledging. That is quite insane growth. Just another interesting fact that I had to share with you guys. So these youngsters now have to, at this, time, uh, this stage of the nesting, have to get ready to take off and do their first flight. So you might think that that is a difficult thing to do. If you're on top of that nest, you're very high up. It's very scary. You can kind of see that with the juveniles if they first take their flight. But believe me, the takeoff is not the difficult part. It is definitely the landing part that is more difficult. So this is just a great photo illustrating how a juvenile underestimated the roundness of a branch. And it just shot right over and then ended up hanging upside down like a bat. Okay, so next up we've got an inexperienced youngster being attacked by an Ovambo Sparrowhawk. Now they're obviously just starting to learn, to, they're just starting to learn to fly and then other raptors already see them as intimidating eagles and they will basically try to intimidate the eagles and attack them and pest them, etc. And that can be quite overwhelming for a bird that's just been on the wing for a few days. So this was exactly the scenario with this photo. 
And it was quite interesting to see. So while I was photographing this, the youngster, I believe this was Nessie, was extremely panicky, um, very vocal calling, and the adults were not in sight. But it was literally 10 seconds after all of this fuss and calling, I started seeing two black spots materializing in the corner of my eye. And the two adults came to just check what's going on and just stooped towards the Ovambo and chased it off. So it was just very cute to see how the adults responded to the panic of the youngster in this on that day when I got this photo. Next up, we've got a close up photo of a youngster in flight with the nictitating brim brains over the eyes. So when I also posted this on Facebook, a few people were very worried about the eagle being blind. So just um, a note on you guys, if you see this, it's not a blind eagle, it's the nictitating membranes covering the eyes. But you can see this is quite a unique photo. It's got a little bit of a ghosty feel to it with the overcast and the gray eyes, etc. Then next up is something that Candace also previously mentioned, and this is the amazing powerful tools of the eagles. So even juveniles leaving the nest, they already possess this extremely powerful deadly weapons that they need to be an eagle. The only difference is they just need to build up experience and learn how to use these tools that they already have. And that is obviously a big difference between a confident, experienced adult and a inexperienced juvenile. But yeah, they obviously have the tools to survive and they must just learn how to. So next up is one of my favorite photos of Nessie taken back in 2013. And it's just, I just had to also include this photo just to show you. It's just such an artistic photo for me. It looks like a painting. And then obviously for most animals, food is almost their entire world. So it's interesting to see that these eagles are extremely opportunistic and would even kill or spend energy to kill small prey like we see in this photo. So we suspect that this is a rock pigeon in the talon there. And I am unfortunately not sure if the youngster or the adults caught it, but I managed to get this photo of this massive eagle with this tiny prey on that day. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what happens later on when the youngsters or the juveniles are starting to become more confident. So we refer to this as the aggression stage. And they are basically, I've got two theories as to why this happened or what it is. So the two are, the one is it, it is a really big part of training for the juveniles. And then eventually it is to basically chase them out of their territory. So normally the males initiate the aggression. So uh, Tulani is in this photo, he's the male in this photo. And he would basically start off and it will start slowly, a little bit of aggression, and then it will pick up and become a bit more serious as time goes on. And then later on, fee, the female will also join the male. And then you've got two experienced eagles basically attacking this one inexperienced juvenile, and that is when it gets really overwhelming for the youngsters. But I have to emphasize that this is not really true aggression. It's really a big part of its training and that it continues for weeks before the youngster actually leaves the area. And the adults even still feed the youngsters while they're being aggressive. So you can imagine the confusion on this youngster, this youngster experience, because all of a sudden, both adults are attacking you and then two hours later they return with prey and you get to eat first. It's just, it's so amazing. I just love this stage in the Black Eagles breeding cycle. And then another thing I must just mention that, like I said, it's not real aggression. They don't really ban the youngsters from the area. They just show aggression towards the youngsters when they are in the gorge where the nest is. So just that little area and every time the youngster flies in there close to the nest, the adults start becoming aggressive towards the youngster. So he starts figuring out, you know what, if I just hang one kilometer away from there, I'm free. The adults don't bother with me. But if I get into that um, specific breeding area, they are aggressive towards me. And then I also believe that curiosity starts taking over and these youngsters just basically start exploring further and further away. 
And then another interesting fact is that the adults continue to feed or bring prey to the youngsters even after they have, less, uh, or have leave, left that uh, breeding area. So if they're four kilometers off, still in the territory of the eagles, they can still deposit prey for the youngsters there just to aid them. But they are basically at this point have to hunt themselves and they will starve if they can't catch their own prey. But it's nice to know that there are records of adults still dropping prey for the youngsters just to aid them at this stage in their um, cycle. So next up is a photo that just shows how a juvenile participates and defends itself against the adult, which also obviously suggests training is also going on here. Next up, we've got a photo that I really love, and this totally, for me, convinces me that a big part of this is training. So what happened was that the adult um, started attacking the juvenile. They did uh, about 20 minutes of this up and down, the adult attacking, and then the adult stopped. And then about 15 minutes later, the, this youngster started attacking this tree in the same way the adult attacked it. So it was basically practicing what its dad was doing to it. So that was just, I was so happy to get this photo and it was such interesting behavior. And then as I mentioned later on, both adults start working together and this is where the aggression gets a bit more serious. And this is also where the youngsters are being overwhelmed by the two experienced adults. And this is where they start getting the idea that they should just start moving out a little bit out of the breeding area and start becoming independent. So what happens after the entire breeding cycle? So usually the youngsters are chased out of the breeding area by mid-December, then they start moving further and further away. And obviously this time the adults don't have any commitments up until March next year when the breeding cycle starts again. So they obviously book a vacation at the beach and just go have a lot of fun. No, I'm just kidding. So it's interesting to see that the adults obviously do have more time for themselves, go fly out for longer periods and obviously can do more cooperative hunting, etc. But they seem to still come back to the botanical garden and roost inside the botanical garden at night. OK, I am going to switch back over to Candace now. Thank you so much, guys. All right, thank you, Ernest. Now what we'll be having a look at is the story since 2016, what's happened, been happening at the, the Botanical Gardens since then. So confirmed Varro Eagle sightings at the Botanical Gardens go as far back as the 1940s. In this time, we've had a very iconic female, Emoyeni. She's the one on the left there. And Emoyeni means upon the wind. She was with us for a grand total of 35 years and she was very well followed and very well known throughout her life. Then we had Tulani, which means the shy one, and he arrived in 1998. And he was a juvenile when he arrived, so that means that he was between four to five years old. And he stayed with us for 21 years. So he was around 25 or 26 when he disappeared. So unfortunately, up until 2016, both of these two birds disappeared. And unfortunately, we don't know what happened to either of them. But interesting, interestingly, Val Gargut's study found that Varroa eagle lifespans is between 10 to 12 years in the wild where many predators occur. So 35 years and 21 years is very, very long in comparison. And that could maybe owe to the fact that they were in their urban location and that gives them the best of both worlds. They are free to move about as they want and they're also very safe as there are very few predators around. Since 2016, we have had a new female as well as new male that arrived in 2019. April 2016 brought with it a new female Makatsa, which means an unexpected surprise. Now, what was interesting is that it was such a seamless transition in the whole history of the Varroa Eagles at the gardens. I mean, this female came in and she was comfortable with people. She was comfortable with the area. She didn't behave any differently than Emoyeni, the previous female. And we actually didn't notice it first, but it was only once we spotted these juvenile feathers right on the top of her head that we actually realized that this was a new female. It's really crazy to think that within a few days, we actually saw two females without knowing it. This is Mathlori, and that means miracle. 
and he arrived in June 2019. Now, what had happened up until that point in the breeding cycle was that Tulani had disappeared a few days before the chick of that year hatched, and Makatsa was left to raise that chick by herself up until over 30 days old. Enter Mathlori. So in nature, infanticide is a rule whereby a new male entering an area kills any existing young from previous males, as there is no real biological advantage to using your own precious energy to raising the genes of a different male. But Matlori really seemed to accept the fact that the chick was there, or so we thought. On the 4th of August, when the eaglet was around 52 days old, Matlori was seen grasping the eaglet and removing it from the nest, the exact moment at which was captured here in this photo by Veronica Adamson. And just to show you that it was indeed the new male that was doing this grasping of the eaglet, here is a comparative photo that was sent to us by Shane Wilkin to show that section of the wing that is matching. Now, unfortunately, this is proof that nature really is a cruel mistress. And no matter how much we were hoping that that chick would survive, it was just not the way that nature worked. But you know what? It's all a part of the adventure of learning about these absolutely incredible birds. Now, unfortunately, we have reached the end of part one, and we hope that you have enjoyed the presentation as much as we have enjoyed presenting it. But please do remember that we do have a part two coming up at the end of next month. So definitely register for that as there are some very interesting topics that we will be covering. Things like interesting observations and stories. Trust me, folks, you would not believe some of these stories without photographic evidence. There will also be interaction with other species. So there'll be some stunning photos of special guests that you might not even know about. Breeding success in juveniles since 2013. That's pretty much the birds and the bees that lead to, well, more birds. And of course, so, so much more. So please, guys, tell your friends, spread the word. These presentations are free and they're so much fun and we'd absolutely love to spread the word about them. I'll be handing you over to Ernest for the last time. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Candice. OK, so I'll just end off this presentation and then obviously Black Eagle Project consists of only volunteers. Not a single volunteer gets paid any salary for being part of the project. So we are very reliant on donations to survive. And obviously all the donations basically go into promoting education for the public and a big part of it goes to protecting the habitat of the eagles. So we do have a platform for international people to donate via PayPal on the website and then also for South Africans to do a direct bank transfer where the details are also available on the website. So I'm going to paste this link into the chat if you guys are interested in donating to our course. And then lastly, this presentation was sponsored by Eagle Eye Safaris. So I'm Ernest Porter, that's me. Um, I'm a co-owner and a photographic guide for Eagle Eye Safari. So if you want, you can go check out our website and maybe join me on a safari in Africa.